Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody's doing well. Welcome, welcome to Covenant Communities Fellowship Tuesday night study in God's Word. Excited about the study that we have to share with you today. I think it's going to be pretty powerful. Um, it's dealing with temptation in our lives, and and all of us have to deal with temptation. And 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 the question is, how do we do it? So we're so glad to have you with us, and uh, and look forward to you being here with us tonight. And again. Uh, welcome to Covenant Community Fellowship, where Kingdom Focus Ministry, where family comes first. We believe that God's word can transform your life. Not in the re not the religious stuff that we talk about so often, but I'm talking about the truth of God's word. And when we apply it in our in our lives, it gives us a competitive edge in the world. And many of us uh, have not enjoyed uh, the competitive edge that comes from being a Christian because we no one's ever really told us. No one's ever really told us that, that following Christ gives you a competitive edge. Brother Pierre, so glad to see you, man. God bless you. Hope things are well there in T-Town, man. Uh, always good to see you. We look for you, man, and, and um, look for you on the broadcast. And we pray for you. And I and I, I know be sure to tell everyone you said hello. And so we always do that to the rest of our Tuscaloosa family, Montgomery, uh, Mobile. So glad to have you with us uh, across Birmingham region. So so glad to have you with us, whichever platform you're on. If you haven't visited us online at uh, Covenant Community, mycovenantcommunity.org, please do learn a little bit more about us. And so again, we are so glad to have you here and to have you here with us. And so we're giving some, a couple of others a little bit more time to come on board. So glad that you are with us. So glad. I wanna tell you, stay encouraged. Don't let the enemy disarm your courage and say, just throw up your hands and say, I'm going to quit. I am tired. I've stanched it till I can't stand it no more. Oh no, you cannot give up, but you must continue to stand strong. Why? Because someone's destiny is tied to your assignment. You can't afford to get off course. Too many people are depending on you. Lady T, good evening, good evening. Uh, so um, as always, my mainstay right there, always with me. Uh, so glad to have you with me. And on this journey, it's a it's a powerful journey. Thank God for it. And uh, thank God to be sharing it with you. Again, stay encouraged. Don't let the enemy disarm your courage. If God is on your side, you have a destiny to win when you follow God's path. And so tonight we're talking about temptation, dealing with temptation. And it's so important because... <clears throat> You knowing how to deal with temptation is really you learning how to deal with the obstacles that come up. And temptation, remember this, temptation always seeks to lead you away from the will of God. Man, I tell you what, once you get that, once you get that, that temptation all, all only seeks and always seeks to move you beyond the will of God. Once you know that, Oh my goodness, it is game on. The enemy desires that you would be discouraged, that you would quit, that, that you would just say, look, it's not worth it. I'm giving up. But I want to encourage you today, stand strong anyway. When it, when it seems that you're by yourself, trust God anyway. When, you seem that, when it seems that doing good really doesn't matter, I want to encourage you again, don't give up. Don't give up on God because God will not give up on you. God says that he is a rewarder to those that diligently seek him. And if you haven't received the promise of God in your life yet, it's like taking a trip to New York. It simply means that you're not there yet. Keep going on. Keep going on through South Carolina and North Carolina. Keep going through Virginia if you will keep going and not grow weary and not faint, if you will do that, then in due season, you will reap what God has planned for you. 
In Psalm 27, we all know what David went through. And David said this, I would have lost hope had I not believed that I would know the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wow. Now that's a testimony. Had I not believed that I would know the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You got to keep holding on. You can't quit now. You come too far to turn back now. This is not the time to turn back. This is the time to press forward. So I encourage you, I challenge you, press forward. Press forward. Don't quit today. Don't quit tomorrow. Don't give up tonight. Joy is coming in the morning. Your morning is coming. All right, let's get into the Bible study, dealing with temptation. Again, I want to talk to you a little bit about what temptation is. Usually when we talk about temptation, the first thing we think about is uh, sexuality. Well, it's not only that, but temptation always seeks to lead you out of the way and out of the will of God. Sometimes we're tempted to say, God, I'm giving you this situation. And, and then an hour later, we're taking it back from God right? Temptation always seeks to take you out of the will of God. So we're going to start. Temptation comes when your mind is being tested and doubted, right? There's a warring or a pulling for you to take on this persona or take on this persona. Do I do it God's way or do I do it the world's way? What do you do when you walk into McDonald's or that other fast food restaurant and that young man, young woman is, doesn't say anything to you. They just look at you like, like, you know, dude order, not welcome, not the, not the Chick-fil-A greeting, but you know, that greeting where, you know, I can't say the way I want to say it, but brother, what do you want? Right. You are challenged in that moment to respond in the flesh or to respond in the spirit. God challenges us to be salt and light. And so when you walk into an, a, a situation like that, it is a setup. You're saying, absolutely, because I wanna get mad. No, I'm flipping it on you. It is a setup for you to keep a godly testimony in an uneasy situation. Now, let me put my hand up. Uh, uh, God knows I've blown it too many times because I really like world-class customer service, without a doubt. But don't forget, temptation seeks to get you to respond in the flesh as opposed to the spirit. Now, responding in the flesh comes from a self-awareness. Responding in the spirit comes from a God-awareness. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 7, and in Romans chapter 7, you can see where even the Apostle Paul had a challenging time dealing with these kind of things. Romans chapter 7. Oh, yeah, this is, this is good. If you have your Bibles, turn to it. Romans chapter 7, right? Uh, beginning where, Pastor Frank? Uh, beginning in verse 13. And I'll put it up on the screen for you. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. All right, let me see. Can I get it up there for you? And, and I, I'll, 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 give, I'll give you a minute. I'll give you a minute to, to really get a hold of that so that you will have it. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. Uh, for those of you that like to read ahead, feel free to read ahead. It's right there for you uh, to enjoy God's word. I'll give you a minute for those of you that are turning to it. Now, the, the, the great apostle Paul, who wrote two thirds of the New Testament, he talks about this challenge that he has inside to, to always maintain and sustain a godly testimony, right? And, he, and he say, he's letting you know, look, I struggle with this sometimes. I, you know, I don't always get this right, but I am working on this, right? And so here's what he said. 
And I've got three versions up here. I always say, you know, I love this. I love the BibleGateway.com. It allows me to have, I've got King James Version over here to the left. And then I've got my favorite ESV. And then I have to the far right, a contemporary English version. And this is what he says. Am I saying something good caused my death? Certainly not. It was sin that killed me by using something good. All right. And this is Apostle Paul talking about good and evil. But here's where I want to get to. Uh, let me see. I'll, I'll keep going in CEV. Verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am merely a human and I have been sold as a slave to sin. In fact, I don't understand why I, I act the way that I do sometimes. I don't do what I know is right. And I do the things I hate. And although I don't do what I know is right, I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing these evil things, but it's the sin that lives in me that does them. I'm going to read it over here. I'm going to read it over here in the middle ESV. And in ESV, you have Paul, right? And what Paul and Paul, what Paul is saying in the ESV, he's saying, look, if it had not been for the word of God, I wouldn't have known what sin was. I'll be in verse 11 in ESV. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So God's commandments are holy, righteous, and good. But there's another thing that's working on the inside of me, and that's my flesh. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin. In other words, he's saying, and he's a, it's a play, it's a play on words. He, and, 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 I, and I want to talk to you right here because it seemed that before I knew what sin was, before I had read scripture, I was doing pretty good. Well, the truth of the matter is that we weren't doing pretty good. We were headed to hell in a little rowboat, and we didn't know it. But because we didn't have any awareness, any guilt and shame, we felt like we were doing pretty good. Because when we messed over people, when we did what we wanted to do, when we took those extra ink pens home from the job, you know, that, that said Am South Bank on them, and it made sure everybody got an ink pen in the family, or a UPS ink pen, you know, I didn't have a problem doing that until I read in God's word, thou shall not steal. And then I had to figure out what stealing was when you take things that don't belong to you. Well, until I began to read God's word, there were things that I did that I had made peace with. And, and it wasn't a problem at all because it's just what I did. And people are always happy to get the goodie bags, right? And so, and so they would get these goodie bags and, you know, oh, they were happy. But then I started getting closer to God and started reading his word. And I found out that there were things that I was comfortable with that God was not pleased with. And so what Paul is saying, he said, so when I began to read the law, I began to see oh my gosh, this isn't pleasing to God. But Paul wanted to make it clear that it wasn't the knowledge of what sin was that made me sinful. It was something else inside of me that made me desire to act out in a way that was not pleasing to God. And it was self, it was the flesh, right? And so just because somebody comes and tells you now uh, that, that this is the truth, it doesn't mean that the truth hurt you. You are being hurt all along without, where, without being aware of it. I just thought that that's just an, an interesting piece. Paul is going through that, and he was saying, look, we don't want to blame it on God. So God gives us his word in order that sin, verse 13, right here in the middle, in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment of God's word might become sinful beyond measure. 
Oh my gosh. When, when the light bulb comes on, you begin to see the damage that we do. Many of us, we, we love things and we use people instead of using things and loving people. God flips the script and says that we have to love one another. Verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual. So the law of God is spiritual because it comes from God. But, and, but he says that there's a problem. I in my natural flesh am not of the spirit, but I am of the flesh sold under the bondage of sin. 15, for I do not understand my own actions sometimes. Is Paul, you are not the only one, brother. For I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very thing that I hate. See, I love pleasing God, but I find that, and I hate displeasing God, letting God down, but I find myself doing the very thing that I hate. And Paul says it doesn't make sense because I have God's word right here. I have, I have a heart's desire to please God. But there's something else that is going on. Verse 16, now, if, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sins, the sin that dwells in me. It is the old nature that is dwelling in me that is compelling me to do the stuff that I used to do that doesn't please God. Wow. Wow, verse 18, now here he comes and he introduces this thing called the flesh, which is the self-awareness, right? For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Now, don't forget, no, that is in my flesh. So he clarified it. See, Paul said, ain't nothing good in me. No, no, no. He clarifies it. He says, there's nothing good in your flesh. Your flesh that Paul refers to is the self-awareness. I am self-focused. I am self-centered. I am self-justifying. I am self-righteous. According to myself, I am the king. It's good to be king. I sit on my throne and I am right. And if, if I'm ever in doubt whether I'm right, I ask myself and then I tell myself, Frank, you are, you are right. But Paul said that there's something though, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. See, my brother, my sister, without being filled with the Holy Spirit, you can have the desire to please God, but you lack the power to carry it out. Yes, the Holy Spirit, once you are born again, as the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you, you now have the power to not only want to please God, but to actually do it. Verse 19, so Paul is identifying, you know, it's like when we find out something's wrong and we know it's not right and, 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 and we're, not, we're not becoming the people that we want to be and we're doing things that are opposite, then we go into self-loathing. Paul is sorting through all of these feelings. How can I be? I know that Christ died for me. I know that he loves me. I know that the father loves me, but yet I would do something that displeases him. Verse 19, for I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who does it. It's not my will, but the sin that dwells within me. You have to understand what he's talking about is that when we have sin in us, when it has not been displaced, that sin could be paradigms. And let, let, me, let me say, that sin that compels us might be us believing something that is not necessarily true. 
when we build our life on the foundation of a lie, if you put a lie on the bottom, then everything that you build on top of the lie will be false. If you have a negative number on the bottom and you multiply 20 positive numbers after that, you know, a negative one times a positive 200 times a positive a million times a positive gazillion, it's going to be negative because the foundation was already wrong. And so a lot of times we have these, these warrings within ourselves because what happens is somewhere we believed a lie. Somewhere we gave ourselves permission to do something that God said is not right. That if I get mad enough, I can cuss somebody out. If I get mad, mad enough, I can, I, can, I can just take, I can take what I believe I deserve. If I get mad enough. The Apostle Paul saying, so look, I know that I've got a new mind, a new heart, and I now desire to please God, but I've got some stinking thinking that makes me think that what I'm doing is all right and it's not. I think that I can have Susie and still be faithful to my wife and still be a faithful man. I, yes, I got Susie on the side and Susie's not my wife. My wife is over here, but I'm still a faithful man and this had nothing to do with me being faith, a faithful man, but it does. See, when we create these double standards within our mind and accept them as true, then we are using dece deception and error as the foundation. And Paul is beginning to say, wait a minute, the flesh that is in me is rooted and comes forth in error. I cannot believe my, the flesh, but I must be led by the spirit of God. Let's keep reading because I'm, I'm going somewhere with this and I want you to see it. Verse 21, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Boy, can y'all feel that? For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. I love to talk about God's word. I love to read God's word. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my member. In other words, it's that contradiction. I, I love God. I'm grateful to God. He's blessed my family, all of this. But then when I get in a certain situation, I have learned how to act when I feel weak, how to be powerful. And I don't like feeling weak. So when I feel weak, I'm cussing up a storm. When I feel weak, I want to give me some liquid courage. And I get that liquid courage in me. And I think I grow it to at least be six feet, four inches tall. And now I'm ready to tear something up. But what happens is I'm still a little man, but I have, I've got that liquid courage in me now. And, I, and, and I, I feel like I'm more in control when I can just show my behind. Paul says, this is crazy. Verse 24, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death, this thing that is in me that is fighting when I get mad, when I don't trust somebody, they're trying to hurt me, all those whispers in my ear. And then the apostle Paul says in verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. It is this flesh. See, it is in our thinking, in our minds, that our minds are like, we've learned some bad stuff and our minds are like spaghetti. I've got a picture that 
you know, I was, I was, tell, I was telling people, uh, some folks earlier today, you know, and I, I, I was we were talking about the other day that all of, when you look at the U.S. interstate system, all of the odd numbers go north and south. So 65 north, 65 south, 75 north, 75 south, I-95 north, I-95 south. All of the odd numbers going across the entire country go north and south. And all of the even numbers go east and west. I-20 east, I-20 west. I-40 east, I-40 west. And so that's the way the interstate system is. And then remember I told you, because I love trivia, so I get to say it again, uh, and, and maybe it's new to maybe one or two people and they say, ooh, ah. And so when you are, when you are on I-65, right here in Birmingham, it means that 35% of the country is east and 65% of the country is west. If you are on I-75 over there in Atlanta and Chattanooga, then it means that 25% of the country is to the east and 75 is to the west. Same thing with the even going across I-10 down by the coast, I-20 right up here in Alabama, I-40 up in, in Tennessee. I-20 means that 20% of the country is south and 80% is north. I-40 means that 40% of the country is south and 60% is north. So it matters where you are. If you say, for instance, if God says that the kingdom of God is north, then I one, I know that I need to be on an odd number interstate because odd number interstates go north and south. And if I'm on an odd number interstate, I don't need to be going south. I need to be going north because that is the way to God. Once you find out through God's word that the way to God is, let's say, for lack of a better word, for teaching purposes, is north, then you never want to drive on the even number interstates, I-20, I-40. Why? Because they always lead away from God. See, the, 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 the odd number interstates, 65, 75, 85, 95, I-95, I-85, I-85, all of those go north and south. And so if you are, one of the things I know that in order to go north, I've got to be on an odd number and I got to be going north and not south. And if I go that way, I will be heading towards the direction God wants me to go. But the even number interstates are themselves defined by their direction. And if I'm trying to go north, I never want to take an even number interstate because they are designed to lead me away from north and take me east and south. I can never go closer to God by traveling in the wrong way. Let me see if I can pull this up for you. I want I want you to see this right here because I think I think it's a I think it's a pretty good um, this it's a pretty good description, and and so and so I really I really want you to see this right. So so as you're looking at as you're looking at north and south right. So if God says that the kingdom of God is north. Hmm. But I could go east and west and south too. Or I can go northeast, right there in the middle between north and east, straddling the fence, or I could go northwest. But God says the kingdom is north. Then I know that if I want to be closer to God, I've got to go this direction, north. However, you know, I do see something that says shortcut this way. But the problem with the shortcut is that it's going east and God is north. See, there are some things that lead us away from God. And, and if we want to be closer to God, 
I want you to know that we have to go in the direction that leads to God, on the road that leads to God. So somebody said, well, what if we go, you see this line right here, what if we go north east, northwest or northeast? See, did you hear the north? It's got a little bit of God in it, but I can still get some of my west in or some of my east in. That, that is why different religious systems and belief systems and all of that are very comfortable to some people because they don't challenge you to go north. They, they tell you that if you go northwest, then you will be able to keep a little bit of what you like in here and also have a little bit of God. See, I got a little north over here. I got a little God on this side and a little west on this side, right? And so it's kind of like straddling the fence. And if you look closely, northwest, the destination, it, it appears to be new, moving northward, but it never arrives because it's going west too. See, we have to understand at the moment we began to go a different direction than what God said, we are now moving away from God. We are saying, God, your way is not the way. The problem is, is that sometimes we believe. Sometimes we believe that we, we believe that we can go away from God and still have God. When, when we, I want you to see this, when we, when we say, okay, I'm going to go west or, or I'm going to go north, then what, I mean, excuse me, east, then right away we are moving away from God because God is north. So when temptation comes, what do you think temptation is going to do? Temptation will always lead you away from God. Hmm. I want you to hear this. Temptation will always challenge you to take a pathway that does not lead to God. And, and when that happens, then you find yourself lonely, empty. You find yourself in a very dark place because the light of God is only with God. It only comes from God. And so you don't go away from God to find God. So when temptation comes, it always wants to lead you away from God. Oh, this is so important. So it's so important that you understand something, that when you are tempted, you are never tempted of God because temptation's goal is to lead you away from God, right? Temptation's job or goal is to lead you away from God, right? So what does God have to say about that? In James chapter one, beginning in verse 12, he talks to you about temptation. And so it's so important that you understand that when temptation comes, it's not a cutesy little thing. Oh man, I was almost tempted, you know, she was all this in a bag of chips. He was all that in a bag of chips, all of that. But what happens is, Look at this right here, ESV in the middle. James chapter one, verse 12. Blessed is the man or woman that remains steadfast under trials. King James Version, Version says, who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And then he says this in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So don't blame God when you are tempted. God cannot be tempted by evil, and he doesn't use evil to tempt others. Why? Because temptation always leads you away from God, and God is seeking to draw you towards him. So verse 14, when we are tempted, we are tempted by our own desires that drag us off and trap us. Our desires make us sin. And when, when sin is finished with us, it leaves us dead. Let me, let me, let me read this uh, in, in, the King James, in the King James Version, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor, God, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But everyone is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire ha has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. So the desire, the lust, the desire that is in us, each person is tempted when she or he is lured and enticed by their own desire, the lust that is within them. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. I want you to hear, I want you to, I want to slow down right here. I want you to see something. If you know me, you see it right there. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. When does a woman become pregnant? Or when does she conceive a child? When the eggs that are within her are fertilized by the sperm. Then conception has it. So for sin in our life, when temptation comes, we have to make sure that we don't water it, that we don't fertilize it, that we don't put our lust on top of it so that Conception happens. When your desire has conceived by being fertilized by your lust, conception happens. It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Oh, my goodness. There's an old saying. You sow a thought. You sow a thought. You plant a, a thought. You'll reap a deed. You sow a deed or plant a, a deed, you'll reap a habit. If you sow your habit or plant a habit in the field, it will produce a character, your character. And if you sow a character, it will produce a lifestyle. See, God knows that that when you sow a seed, you're literally sowing a tree, that the fullness of that tree is in that seed. Inside of that seed is an embryo that is, that is uh, what is the word, that is lying dormant, in, filled with protein. 
right? But what happens is when you sow that seed and, and the hole dies, then that which was dormant on the inside now comes alive and begins to produce a tree in the middle of your family, in the middle of your job, in the middle of your church, in the middle of your life. This thing grows and grows and grows. And it was a fully, it was a tree when it was a seed. Before you fertilized it, before you, you sowed it, before you watered it. Had you left it, it would have abided alone. But when you plant the seed of your of temptation within your life, it will bear much fruit. All of a sudden, it comes like the hydra. And so the apostle Paul, when he, excuse me, and in James, so when he looks at this, he says, then desire, verse 15, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, it brings forth death. We have too many dead marriages, too many dead dead careers, too many talented people who, who have lost their way and are no longer in the NFL, the NBA, multimillionaires, but because they allowed something to be sown into their mind, their heart, that thing grew and they took a risk and, and here they were. I was watching something from uh, Shaquille O'Neal and he talked about it. What, ha what happened to your family, Shaq? You know, what, what, what happened? What happened? When did it start, Shaq? Uh, I, want you, I want you to hear it. My wife was as at home when when did you know when did it start something happened and Shaq has the luxury now to look back on it and when he looks back on it he's saying uh oh i'm seeing now and this for a man that is 7 feet something tall having a sincere moment i want you to hear this look i was just being i had the perfect situation Wife was finer than a mug. Kept giving me baby, still finer than a mug. I had it all. Just sometimes you, and I don't make excuses. I know I messed up. And then, you know, when I didn't have that, I was lost. 76,000 square foot house by yourself. Lost. No kids. Go to the gym. Nobody playing in the gym. You go to their room. Nobody's there. You, you, you start to feel it. Look, sin, when fully conceived, it brings forth the death of families, the death of marriages, the death of careers, the death, the death of a name, the death of a church, the death of, of the character of, an, of a person that is well known when fully conceived. The tree becomes too big to manage, but when it was a seed when it was temptation, that was the time to deal with it. So when they said, we need to nip that in the bud, they were saying, we need to, we need to nip this rose bush right now in the bud before it becomes a full grown bloom. We can't play with this but too often we play with it. And when we play with it, it grows on us and it grows on us and it grows on it. You sow a thought, you reap a deed. You sow a deed, you reap a habit. I keep doing it. Uh, it's a habit now. And if you sow the habit, it creates your character. It means to be deeply engraved within you. You sow a character, you reap a lifestyle. And God brings forth life. I came that you might have life and have that life more abundantly. It is not God's will or God's plan that what he has given you 
would die. But yet and still, careers are lost. Freedom is lost. Why? All because that we did not deal with sin correctly. Verse 16, he says this, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation of shadow due to change. Of his own will he, will he, will he brought us, has he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Listen to what he's saying. Well, you know, sometimes I don't know if it's God. You, you do know if it's God because the spirit of discernment is not for you to discern evil. It is, dis, it is given to you to be able to discern what is God, what is right, what is true, what is God honoring, what glorifies God, what blesses God, what edifies your family and those that you love. You know when things are from God. Because God is never going to tempt you to go away from him and to go away from what is right. And so the writer is saying, look, so you can trust God. Know this, verse 19, my beloved brothers and sisters, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. This is that flesh consciousness and the God consciousness. So I'm knowing that Anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. And so he says, because you can trust God, now this gives context to this thing, doers of the word, right? Because you can trust that God is always taking you north, always propelling you towards your destiny. God is not trying to trick you to see what is in you. The word of God says he knows your thoughts from afar off. The very hairs on your head are numbered. God knows you. Before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. When you were in your mother's womb, I saw what you were going to have to deal with. I saw my plans and purpose for your life for good, not for evil, evil to prosper you to an expected end. I anointed you to rise above whatever came against you. It will come against you, but it would not kill you. It will come against you, but it would not take you out. It would come against you. It would be like the weeble, the little, the little blow up doll with the sand and then you hit it and it comes back. The weeble wobbles, but it, it doesn't fall down. God has put something in you to keep you going. And so because of that, because you can trust God, he's saying, look, trust me, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law of God, the law of liberty, and, per and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer that acts he will be blessed in his doing. Let me read that again, verse 25. This might be one of those verses that you write down and that you put up. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the word of God, the law of liberty, and, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer that acts. Don't be a hearer that forgets, but be a doer that acts, and God will bless you. In fact, it says God will bless you in everything you do if you listen and obey and don't just hear 
and forget God will bless you in everything you do. Right? And if you continue in, and you're not for, a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in all in what you do. Now listen, we got to do what the word of God says. So if you think that you are religious and you can't, and you don't bridle your tongue, you are deceiving your heart, right? You are deceiving your heart. If, if you think that you are a, 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 a God follower, but you're not doing his word, right? You're being religious. You know, you got a half foot on God's stuff. You going Northwest, Northeast and a half foot on your stuff. Now, and God says, now, if, if you want my religion, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Look, I love this. I love this because remember in dealing with temptation. And I want you I want you to hear this when dealing with temptation. People know that the best version of you is that version that is that is that is going after God. That is the best version of you. The one that is pursuing God. Let me see if I can get to it. There it is. That is the best version of you. Now, I want you to hear this. That when someone comes to you trying to get you, then say, you are so handsome. You are so fine. You are so cute. You are so beautiful. Oh, I love the way you worship God and how you raise your family. Let Come with me and pour your flesh out on my flesh. I respect you so much. Come west with me. Come east with me. In fact, come south with me. I love you so much that I'm willing to kill that which is good in you. Wow. If everything that is good in me comes from God, then a person who finds you so attractive and so irresistible that they are willing to lead you west, south, and east away from God is not doing you a favor. How can they say they love you and care about you, but they're willing to kill the very thing that they say that they are impressed with, that they value, they're willing to kill it. See, we have to begin to hear things like God hears them. When people come, you know you're a better man, a better husband, a better father, a better son, a better friend, the closer you are to God going north. You know you're a better wife, a better daughter, a better mother, a better sister, and a better friend as you're moving closer to God. But here, these people, they look at you and they say, I love you so much. I care about you so much. I miss you so much. Go, come west with me. Come east with me. Come south with me. Taking you away from the very God that made you everything that you are. That is not a compliment. That is not a blessing. That is a deception. You've been hoodwinked bamboozle, led astray. Because God will only call you to him. He will only bid you to come. He says, come unto me, all ye that are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God doesn't tell you don't go 359 degrees other, all right? He just tells you to go one direction, north towards him.
this might be your time to say, God, I just want to go north. It's been hard being a Christian, a religious person who's been managing all this sin, 359 degrees of sin. And you mean to tell me that all this time, all I've got to do is one thing, and that's follow you north. Not east, not west, not south, not northeast, not northwest, but just north. I may not be able to do all these different things, God, but I can do one thing, and that's follow you north. And if all I have to do is one thing in following God, then my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and I can do that because I'm tired of playing whack-a-mole that, you, you know, after I get rid of 10 sins, I come back and it's 10 more, and I'm being beat over the head, and, and all I'm doing is managing sin. And God says, I never called you to manage sin. I've called you to embrace the righteousness of Christ and follow Christ as he leads you to be reconciled with the Father. God only asks you to do one thing, pick up your cross and follow me. That's a powerful scene. Well, look, I hope that this discussion helped a lot in the sense of knowing you got to know how to deal with temptation and you got to understand that you may be playing with temptation, but temptation is not playing with you. Temptation is a full grown lion waiting to be birthed, a full grown hippopotamus, a full grown tree that once you fertilize it with your lust, then conception will happen and that thing will begin to exponentially grow until it takes a life of its own and consumes you. Don't let it be so. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. My body belongs to God. My mind, it belongs to God. Every gift, every talent, every ability that I have, it belongs to God. My tomorrow belongs to God. My, my, my next year belongs to God. My past and future belong to God. I believe God. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. It begins with a decision. Have you made that decision? Have you reaffirmed that decision? Does God know where you stand with him? Does God know where you stand with him? If he doesn't, he needs to know. God needs to know where you stand with him. If God be God, then serve him. And if Baal be God, then serve him. But choose this day. For a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But it's an even bigger fool who says there is a God and then will not serve him. God is worthy of your praise and your worship. God's heart's desire is for relationship and fellowship with you. Now, look, I think that's pretty awesome. God wants a relationship with you. God wants to fellowship with you. And all you have to say is, God, I'm ready. You be my God and I will be your people. Where you lead me, I will follow. Where you lead me, I will follow. Where you lead me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. God is looking for a faithful man, a faithful woman who will dare to believe God at a time when the world is focused on themselves. I pray that this would be the day that you make a decision to be all in to be all in with God, to begin the pursuit of learning what that means and for being a saint of God, his beloved, 
that is all in. Look, we love you. God bless you and God keep you. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning at 930. You all have a great day and God bless you. Remember, yield not to temptation, to temptation. Yield not. Don't play with it. It is not worth it. Why? Because temptation of all kind leads you away from God's will and purpose for your life. Look, we love you. God bless you, covenant community, fellowship. We love you guys. To the family, extended out of town, we love you guys. And we pray God's bless so blessings over you. So y'all take care. And until next time, remember, Satan is defeated, darkness is dispelled, and Jesus is Lord. God bless. Have a great day.